Fluorescent proteins have found a wide use in virology research. These have revolutionized the kinds of things that we can do. The first green fluorescent protein, of course, was discovered in, in jellyfish. Uh, and the chair of biology of here, or the former chair of biology, as you may know, uh, received the Nobel Prize for his work on GFP in uh, C. elegans. Um, many other derivatives of GFP have since been made, and other isolates have been discovered with different colors, and there are all sorts of uh, not only greens, but reds and magentas as well. And these can be used to detect uh, virus infected cells in real time. So in contrast to antibody based tests where you typically uh, may have to destroy your sample in order to stain it with your antibody, there's some exceptions, but typically it's, uh, it's an invasive procedure that terminates your infection. With GFP, with the fluorescent proteins, you can monitor infections in real time and not interrupt the infection. So you can take a culture Let's say you have put a, a, a green fluorescent protein gene in your virus genome, so the virus now expresses it. You can infect cells with that virus, and then at different times after infection, take the infected cells out of the incubator and look for the expression of green fluorescent protein. You simply put the cells under a UV microscope and look for fluorescence. And then you can put them back in the incubator and then look again later. So it's real-time detection and it's non-disruptive. This is a very interesting experiment shown in this slide where what we see in the middle is a cluster of uh, cells in a monolayer and they have been infected with various herpes viruses that are carrying uh, three different, one of three different color fluorescent proteins. And there is a range of colors you can see here and that is because uh, the cells can be infected with multiple green or red and blue viruses and form uh, shades of intermediate colors. And so by calculating all the different shades of colors that were produced in the infected cells, starting with three different colored herpes viruses, they could calculate the maximum number of viruses that could ever infect the cell, at least with this particular herpes virus. Here are two other applications of, of uh, fluorescent proteins to uh, virus research. On the left, uh, what's been done is to insert the gene for a green fluorescent protein into the genome of a herpes virus. Uh, and then this herpes virus is used to infect a rat. And the virus is neurotropic. It replicates in neurons. And you can see here this beautiful neuron where the cell body and the axons and dendrites are full of green fluorescent protein that's been produced by this virus that is producing the GFP protein. And you can actually map the neural circuitry using these viruses. You can very precisely inoculate uh, these viruses with a needle into a particular part of the brain and then map where that, those neurons are connected to elsewhere by simply tracing them by the green fluorescent protein. Really interesting approach. We can also see now single virus particles. We have high resolution microscopy coupled with the use of fluorescent proteins. We can visualize individual virus particles. That's of course because the light amplifies their size. And here on the right uh, are individual particles of human immunodeficiency virus. They're in green within a cell. Uh, and the cell has been stained with an antibody to the cytoskeletal network. So you can see these, these uh, fibrous looking structures are part of the cy cellular cytoskeleton and these viruses are actually moving along individual microtubules. So the green virus is moving down the microtubule. We now know from these kinds of studies and others that when viruses move within the cell they do so by moving along the cell cytoskeleton. Really remarkable. Uh, here is a movie uh, showing an infected neuron and by a herpes virus ex that is, uh, has incorporated a green fluorescent protein into the virion itself. So you can see in the cell body, it's full of individual virions, but in addition, the virions are moving 
along the processes here in this particular part you can see the the individual virions moving away from the nucleus it's remarkable so they're made in the nucleus in the cell body sorry not the nucleus this is the entire neuron cell body they're made in the cell body and then they move outwards and that's how they get to other neurons and that's why you can trace them in part really remarkable technology another uh, technology i want to mention for a couple of reasons is polymerase chain reaction. Uh, this is a way of detecting very, very low quantities of nucleic acids in a sample. And it's based on the idea that you use a DNA polymerase that is thermostable. You mix uh, primers with your sample. So let's say you're looking for a virus. You design nucleic acid primers and then you take them and you add the primers to your sample. You denature whatever nucleic acids are present, and then you do a round of DNA polymerization using this heat-stable DNA polymerase. You then, after the elongation, you have a product made. You then do another round of denaturation and annealing to primers again and more extension. And eventually, you get exponential growth of the product made by your two primers and that thermostable DNA polymerase. So this is a very sensitive technique that can detect small amounts of DNA and even RNA if you first convert it uh, to DNA. It's used extensively in research. We use it in the lab all the time. It's used in industry to make recombinant DNA products and it's used for diagnosis of viral infections. This is another game changer in the world of science in general, but particularly in virology and microbiology. It's allowed us to do so many things that we couldn't do before. The whole technique, PCR, its presence is really uh, based on serendipity. Back in the 1960s, a microbiologist by the name of Thomas Brock was very interested in these hot springs that are present throughout the country, particularly in Yellowstone uh, National Park. These are very, very hot waters. They, tend, they can also be uh, extreme environments in terms of pH. He isolated in the environment a bacterium called Thermus aquaticus. And he thought it would be interesting to study how this bacterium uh, could live in these extreme environments. And it turned out that the DNA polymerase from this bacterium, as you would expect, was pretty thermostable. And so in the 1980s, Kerry Mullis and his colleagues thought of using that DNA polymerase for this, making this PCR uh, scheme. So you need to have a thermostable DNA polymerase because there are multiple cycles, often 30 or 40, of annealing, elongation, and denaturation. So the enzyme has to be able to withstand the denaturation step, which occurs at 95 degrees Celsius. And what better enzyme than one from a hot spring? So Tom Brock had no idea that his enzyme, his bacterium, could, be, could revolutionize uh, molecular biology. And it just, again, is another example of how, with research, you never know where your work is headed. Sometimes you think you do, but quite often you're surprised. And this is another example of surprise. Another revolution uh, that we enjoy, so we've had um, PCR as part of the revolution, um, and we have had another one here called deep high throughput sequencing. Now we've had the ability to sequence nucleic acids, that is determine the order of A, C, G, and T for a while now from the late 70s. And in fact, um, this is how we used to do it. We used to run sequencing reactions out on gels and make autoradiographs and then read them by hand. Uh, I did this as a postdoc for the poliovirus genome. It was the 7,400 and 40 nucleotide RNA molecule, and I determined its nucleotide sequence. It took me one year to do that. Today, this could be done in 10 minutes because we have very rapid sequencing approaches that are incredibly fast. You can sequence millions of bases in hours, but also deep. They have very high coverage of each molecule, so you have very high accuracy. Deep high throughput sequencing. So this picture is not deep high throughput sequencing. This is the, the hand stuff that I used to do years ago. Uh, nowadays you can do much more 
This has introduced a whole new field of what's called metagenomics. You can take samples from the environment, you can take clinical samples, and sequence all of the nucleic acid in these samples. And you can know all the bacteria and all the viruses and what other microorganisms or other forms of life are present in them. So we can identify new viruses in environmental samples. You can get sewage and see what's, what viruses are here. You can take your gut bacteria and sequence in them and say what bacteria or what viruses are present there as well. And that's because you can sequence a lot in a very short period of time with great accuracy. You can also use this to identify new pathogens. You can take someone who has an illness, you don't know what's causing it, you can take samples from those individuals, sequence and look for new agents. So this again, I, I may say, say it too many times, but this has revolutionized uh, molecular biology, uh, the ability to do this. Now recently on TWIV we talked about two examples of pathogen discovery uh, using these high throughput deep sequencing approaches. If you're interested, listen to these. 196, an arena for snakes. A brand new virus which seems to cause a, a long known disease in snakes. We talked with Joe DeRisi who is a virus discovery person at UCSF and he uh, was sent a photograph of a snake by a young lady who had it as a pet and the snake was sick. He got interested in this snake disease and ended up finding a new virus by deep sequencing. In episode 199, we talked about uh, a, a new tick-borne virus found in two patients in Missouri who had severe uh, febrile illness. These are two farmers who had a history of tick bites and a, a similar febrile illness. When their specimens were sequenced, they found a new, uh, the same virus in both of them uh, in Missouri, which may cause this disease. So again, another way that you can use deep sequencing to discover new pathogens. Uh, last year, uh, an article was published uh, which showed that illegally imported wildlife products that people try to bring in uh, from other countries into the US, for example, also often contain viral sequences. So people go to exotic places, they collect animal parts, heads and arms and so forth, such as these. They try and bring them in the country. Most of the time they are confiscated and the CDC decided, let's look in some of these to see if uh, any viruses are present. And so uh, the, the laboratory of Ian Lipkin, another virus discoverer, uh, this time at, at Columbia University, uh, collaborated with the CDC. and They found, in fact, that many of these uh, products have viral sequences in them, viruses of all different sorts. Now, we don't know if these are infectious viruses. The work didn't report any recovery of infectious replicating viruses, but there are viral sequences which suggest that at some time or other there might have been uh, viruses infecting these animals. I mean, these are monkeys and uh, and apes of various sorts who at one point in their lives probably were infected by one or more viruses as we all are and so uh, you have to be careful when you bring these in these could be infectious and they, they could cause infections I do have a little quibble with this headline in the Times from the jungle to JFK viruses cross borders and monkey meat well we don't know if there are actually infectious viruses there we only know there are sequences and whether they're infectious or not remains to be discovered. Uh, anyway, another, another way that uh, we can use these techniques for discovering new viruses.